15 years ago, I bought a 60,000 euro phase noise analyzer and discovered that its measurement software was giving me false readings. Since then, I never trust any new piece of equipment without verifying it myself. I recently bought a QA403 high performance USB audio analyzer for accurate noise measurements. But to trust the noise floor, you first need to verify the signal to noise ratio. In this video, I'll show you how to prove its accuracy at home using nothing more than a normal PC output. I spent four weeks on this video so I can explain these more complex subjects in a simple, usable way. I even wrote my own Python code to generate calibration signals and to calibrate the true SNR. Let's get started. The first thing you're going to need is an extremely accurate calibration signal. Let me show you exactly how to create such a signal from scratch. For this calibration we want a signal with a very accurate noise level. Creating a noise signal is not hard, but measuring it very accurately is. So how do you do that? One solution is to link the noise to something you can measure very accurately. A signal with a spectrum like this one is very useful for that. You see a flat noise floor, called a white noise floor, with a signal. The advantage of this type of signal is that you can measure the tone very accurately with a multimeter. Since you know the relative noise level of this signal, since you're going to create it yourself, you can now calculate the amplitude of this noise floor exactly. You may wonder why it's hard to measure a noise signal. That is because you need to know the exact measurement bandwidth of your measurement equipment, which you don't know. So that would mean you'd have to build a calibrated filter for that, which is a lot of work. So how are you going to create such a signal? You'll need some basic signal processing knowledge. Let me show you. Let's assume you make a WAV file that can be easily calculated on a PC. Once you have that, you can play this WAV file using the same PC and connect it to the QA403 for measurement. Let's assume you use a 16-bit resolution and a 48 kilohertz sample rate, called FS. 16-bit signals have a range of plus 32,767 to minus 32,768 steps. Let's assume for now that each step equals 1 volt. So let's create a large sine wave with an amplitude of 20,000 volts peak and a noise signal with a 1,000 volts peak level. These are more or less arbitrary choices. You need to know the RMS voltage of the signal. Calculating this is easy. Just dividing the amplitude by the square root of 2, which gives you 14,142 volts. You also need the RMS value of the noise. If you create uniformly distributed noise with a known peak value, the RMS level of that is the peak level divided by the square root of 3, which is 577.35 volts. This is the resulting time signal. As you can see, it is really, really noisy. You would not see something like this in real life, but this is great for calibration purposes. So you have the RMS value of the total noise, but you don't know the noise level of the noise floor in the spectrum yet. The most common way to express a noise floor is in volts per square root of hertz. This is basically the noise voltage in a bandwidth of 1 hertz. This is also called voltage noise spectral density. But how do you calculate this based on the RMS noise voltage? Because this is a sampled signal, the noise can only exist up to half the sample rate. This means that all the RMS noise voltage has to spread evenly in a band of 0 to 24 kHz since we use a 48 kHz sample rate. In order to spread the noise equally, you divide the RMS voltage by the square root of the bandwidth as shown in the formula. This results in a noise floor with a value of 3.73 volts per square root of Hertz. You may be wondering why you have to divide by the square root of the bandwidth and not just the bandwidth. Since this is crucial to understand, let me show you why by going the other way around, from noise floor to RMS voltage. But first you need to understand how to add noise sources. When you want to add two uncorrelated noise sources, which means that they are both completely random with respect to each other, you have to square them first to get their noise power spectral density, then add them and then take the square root again. One could say you have to add their power. Now let's see what happens if you want to add multiple noise sources having the same noise voltage Vn. If you have two sources, you multiply the noise voltage by the square root of 2. With three equal sources, it would be the square root of 3 times the noise voltage. So you multiply with the square root of the number of sources that you have. So now that you know how to add noise sources, let's see how this applies to calculating RMS noise voltages based on a noise floor with a given voltage noise spectral density. You can think of such a floor as a number of independent noise sources with a bandwidth of 1 Hz. So to get the total noise voltage in a given bandwidth, you simply multiply the voltage noise spectral density with the square root of the bandwidth. In this example you see a band of 6 Hz, so 6 independent sources, so the square root of 6 times the noise voltage. Now you know where the square root of the bandwidth comes from. Now that you fully understand the calibration signal and all its properties, 
Let's see how we can use this in combination with the QA403. The QA403 noise software has a noise mode that shows the noise as voltage per square root of hertz, as you can see in the scale on the right. But even with averaging, it's hard to actually read the value of the noise floor. What the software can do very accurately is measure the signal to noise ratio, called SNR, in a given bandwidth. The signal to noise ratio is exactly what it says it is. The ratio between the RMS value of the signal and the RMS value of the noise. So if you know the SNR and you know the signal level, you know exactly what the RMS noise voltage is. What makes this SNR measurement very accurate is that it averages the noise over a larger bandwidth that you can set yourself in the software. So this means you must know what the SNR value of the calibration signal is. Let me show you how to calculate this. What you see here is a recap of what we already know. The SNR of a signal is just the ratio in decibels between the signal and the noise. You can see the formula to calculate it. The resulting SNR is 31.58 decibels. So now you know exactly what SNR, the QA403, should show you when you apply the calibration signal you just made. I've put all the calculation steps in the single page to give you an overview. You can pause the video here in case you want some time to have a look at this. The next step is to create the actual calibration signal using Python. It's a very small program. Let me show you. So this is the program. There are a number of input fields to set up the signal level, noise level, sample rate and duration. Next, the sine wave is generated. After that, the noise. Then they're added and rounded to the nearest 16-bit integer. And finally, everything is saved to a WAV file with the last few lines of the code. So, let's start hooking things up. So you first need to get a signal from your PC and get all the settings in your PC correct, in this case for a Windows system. You can use the line output at the back of your motherboard or the headphone output at the front. Just make sure that the right output is enabled and all the volume settings are maximized. Then play the WAV file using an audio player and maximize that volume as well. Make sure that any equalizer settings you may have in your PC are turned off, otherwise the noise floor won't be flat, which means the measurements will not be accurate. Now you start up the QA403 application and set it up as shown on the image here. There are a few settings that must be done through menus. The first one is the noise measurement mode. You do this by right clicking the DBV button and then selecting root hertz as indicated by the arrows. The next thing to set is the SNR bandwidth. You do this by right clicking the SNR button and filling in 100 and 10,100 in the start and stop frequency fields. This results in a 10 kHz SNR bandwidth. So let's see what kind of measurement you get for the SNR. 31.89 dB. We were expecting 31.58 dB from the calculation. Quite close, but the error is just a little bit higher than I expected. Since the audio output of the PC and the QA403 should be very flat up till 10 kHz, and the noise floor also looks very flat on the measurement spectrum, I would expect an even better result. So let's see if averaging will improve things. This definitely makes the noise floor look a lot less hairy, and it confirms that the floor is very nice and flat. However, the SNR error has suddenly increased to 1.3 decibels. This must be a calculation error somewhere. Single runs without averaging always show up 0.3 dB error plus or minus 0.06 decibels. Averaging should stay within that range. Now I have an idea what's going wrong here. Most likely, the voltage noise spectral density is averaged instead of the noise power spectral density. Just like when you are adding noise sources, when averaging, you have to do that in the squared domain, or otherwise called the power spectral density domain. If you average in the voltage spectral density domain, you'll cause the noise to be 1.05 decibels lower. This seems to be very close to the difference we see. Now the only reason I think this is the cause is because I just made the same mistake a few days ago working on this video. I caught it however because my test was done 100% in software, so all results should be within 0.01 dB or something like that. So a 1 dB error really should not happen there. This shows you how you have to be on your toes all the time and be very vigilant about errors, as it's very easy for such a small error to creep in. So maybe this is something Quant Asylum can confirm and have a look at. So let's circle back to this 0.3 decibel error without averaging. Let's try some different options, like other window functions for the analysis. So previously a Han window was used, now a flat top window is selected and you suddenly see an error of 1.05 decibels. So now you should really begin to worry that there are some small details that don't add up perfectly. Window functions should not impact the SNR results as far as I know. In this overview you see the SNR results with different windows. Now the rect or rectangular window is shown in orange because it's not really a good one to use. I'd like to explain this further, but then I open a whole can of worms which takes it a bit out of scope for this video. So, you seem to be stuck. The measurement application limits our options. 
However, the time signal the QA403 captures can be exported so you can do the SNR analysis yourself in Python for instance. Let's see what happens when we do that. Explaining the signal processing for this Python program is a bit too much for this video. That would be a whole video in itself. If you're interested in seeing this, then leave a comment, show me the SNR algorithm. If I receive more than 50 comments requesting that within two weeks, I'll make that video. This will also explain the can of worms of window functions I just mentioned. Here you see the results of the QA403 software and my own Python SNR program. As you can see, the results using the Python SNR program are very accurate with a maximum error of just 0.05 decibels. Ignore the rect window results. As I already mentioned, rect or rectangular windows, basically meaning no window at all, is not suitable for SNR measurements. You may also note that the voltage of my own SNR program is equal for all measurements. This is because I use the same time signal for all four results, resulting in an equal signal level. I did verify this result with multiple time signals so I did not get a lucky shot here. Now you may think that the SNR algorithm of the QA403 is not good, but the reality is is that making an SNR algorithm that works for all signal and spectrum types is really hard as it has to adapt itself to the signal type. I optimized my Python program for just this type of signal which makes it relatively easy. Plus, I have more than five years of experience writing these algorithms as I very often needed them to validate prototype high-speed AD converters. If this way of reasoning and designing resonates with you, I've made a free electronic product development checklist and a one hour free mini course on practical PCB and electronic design. It focuses on how everything fits together when you go from a conceptual schematic to a finished product. I also have a full course available. Links are in the description. Now let's take a step back. The goal was to create a signal with a noise floor that is precisely tied to the signal level. Now that we can measure the SNR to within 0.05 decibels, the noise spectral density of the noise floor is known just as accurately. All we have to do is scale it, but there's one critical value still missing, the signal level. So let's measure that as accurately as we can. We can do this with multimeters. So here you see the measurement results of the signal level measured by the QA403 and four different multimeters. The results are very close together, but pay attention to the green arrows. That is the comparison between the HP34401A and the QA403. They're nearly on top of each other. Now the 34401A is a six and a half digit tabletop multimeter with ridiculous accuracy and by far the best multimeter of the four. Today's equivalent costs around 1600 euros. This shows that the QA403 is extremely well calibrated. We can definitely trust the signal level it shows. Also very nice to see is the result of the Parkside, which is a 15 euro or $18 multimeter from the local supermarket. A very small error. This is because the signal is dominated by a sine wave and even inexpensive meters measure that correctly. Another observation is that when you measure the signal with or without the noise, it hardly has an effect on the voltage readout. That's because this is an RMS measurement. The signal and noise have to be added squared, just like noise sources. Since the RMS noise voltage is much smaller than the RMS signal voltage, its contribution hardly changes the result. Now that you know the signal voltage very accurately, you can scale the noise floor to get its voltage noise spectral density. The thing you've been chasing this whole video. On the left you see the values of the signal and noise that you calculated before. On the right you see the measured signal level and the scaled noise floor level. The noise floor level is calculated by multiplying the digital noise with the ratio of the measured signal level and the digital signal level. The noise should be 358.13 microvolts per square root of hertz. My Python SNR program also has the ability to show an average noise floor. So this is the moment of truth. Let's look at the result. This is insane! Look at this result. The measured noise is exactly what it's supposed to be. This means we can use the QA403 combined with this Python code to do ridiculously accurate noise floor measurements, which is exactly what I need for checking three different low noise amplifiers I've designed for some of my next videos. This type of noise plot might be a very nice addition to the QA403 software as well. Maybe Quant Asylum is interested in adding this at some point. Now if you think about this result a little bit longer, it should not come as a surprise. Since the SNR was known within 0.05 decibels, the noise floor should be just as accurate. 0.05 decibels is just 0.6%. So we can conclude that the QA403 has insanely accurate hardware, but a few small details in the software can be improved. The averaging fix should be easy. The SNR algorithm used by the QA403 software is a bit of a harder one to fix probably, and maybe the error is caused by my specific type of test signal. However, my hands are kind of itching to give this a try, especially if you guys request it a lot in the comments. 
It would be a really nice challenge to try and make a self-adapting SNR algorithm that gives very accurate results no matter what kind of time signal you put in. So I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe you're curious about my course if you like this kind of content. Links are in the description. If you want to prevent nasty problems when using ferrite beads as supply filters, have a look at this video. See you next time.